I was given the title, We Know, Don't We? Well, I'm not quite sure what we do know. I have no relevant conflicts with this. I was a member of the AO Foot and Ankle Expert Group for 10 years. Um, we'll skate over the ankle replacement. And probably the one conflict I do have is that I run an advanced foot and ankle arthroscopy course. Um, what do we actually know? We do know that these injuries are not all the same fracture pathology. And we tend to think about classifications, but we don't think about pathology. And it's the pathology that will ultimately define the outcome for the patient. Potentially, they are all bad injuries with a bad prognosis. And of course, in my world, the thing that I focus on is the fact that patients presenting with ankle arthritis to me, um, the instance of post-traumatic arthritis is much greater than you see in knees and hips. And it also has an earlier age of onset. So trauma is a major cause of ankle arthritis. And we don't really have much evidence as to what is the ideal thing to change that prognosis. We've heard um, some excellent lectures throughout the BOA about um, just cultures and about instigating change. But we have to identify how we might uh, uh, make a change and we have to identify what's important to change and it, if you put together the argument about the instance of post-traumatic arthritis um, and the fact that we don't really know what uh, changes the prognosis maybe this is something we've got to look at more um, we have to look at those factors which might influence the prognosis now the pathology of the fracture is slightly different from the classification of the factor. Um, the pattern, of course, is part of that classification. Um, displacement, how much it's been displaced, will actually create greater damage to the joint surface. And that probably is a factor that is a major prognostic factor that we have little control of. That's what happens at the time it happens. Communution is something that in these injuries I don't think we've had enough awareness of and of course, we all know that quality of bone, age, and so forth makes a big difference. So what sort of things might make a difference to our outcomes? Well, if you can reduce the secondary intraarticular damage in some way, then maybe you influence the outcome and the prognosis. The one thing that we probably know does that is movement, possibly weight-bearing as well, and to do that, you need to look at stability and congruent reduction. Now, some of these injuries, when you look at them in detail, are spectacular. So you look at the set of x-rays in plaster on your, right, your left-hand side, um, and you'd look at that ankle fracture, and you'd say, okay, there's a bit of a posterior malleolar fracture, it's not a big deal, surely, and whatever. You then get a CT, and you spot various things. One, the, the 3D reconstruction really paints a picture of a very badly injured ankle. Two, that there are the little bits, little bits of communition that are going to define your ability to actually reduce this. And as such, it's the little bits that count. Um, so this is really quite a serious looking injury to that joint off moderately innocuous looking x-rays. So what is a posterior malleolus fracture? What is really going on? And we need to talk about different mechanisms really than we've been taught. So Larg Hansen, I think, needs to go out of the window. I've never really understood it. You know, hitting a limb in mid-air to break the ankle is not a recognized mechanism. The only well-documented injury of that sort that I know of was actually David Beckham broke his ankle that way, hitting a ball in midair, which might be regarded as a bit of a wuss type thing, really. But, you know, Beckham's Beckham, isn't he? There are studies out there that look at videos of mechanisms of injury, so videos of injuries occurring, and try and apply the principles of displacement um, from 
that rather historic classification and found that it's only about 65% predictive of the pattern of uh, fracture. And as such, as I say, it's probably time we started to abandon it. The AO classification is, is both useful and is somewhat predictive, gets up to about 81%. But Haraguchi's studies really change your thinking about this because in weight-bearing studies where you use the equivalent of the body force to rotate around a fixed foot, then the pronation component of it, the translation and the external rotation actually become the factors that will produce all of the patterns of injury that we recognize. And we may need to look at that more. And now we're starting to see more publications of papers where his work is quoted as a classification. So what do I think about? What do I do when I look at any form of ankle injury? And this was a guy who came off a boat, um, naval guy, um, had been at sea for some time. Um, I think he'd been chasing Russian submarines and Russian submarines had been chasing him. They seemed to like to play submarine tag for about three months. But he'd done some things to his ankle. He didn't really feel that it was too bad. The medical officer on board thought that he could cope and um, so they didn't do anything to take him off. And when you actually look, he's got a little bit of some sort of avulsion fracture at the back, which is a sort of posterior malleolar fracture. And you don't pay much attention to the ankle. It looks pretty good on the AP. There's a suspicion that maybe something's not right about the syndosmosis. But he had a lot of pain around his syndosmosis. And when you inevitably, of course, arthroscope him, what you actually see is that the syndosmosis is in big trouble. That is actually a 4.5 arthroscopic resector just dropping into the gap. Something you perhaps wouldn't appreciate off those plain x-rays. And you see the little bit of the avulsion fracture at the back has actually just taken out all of the posterior stabilizers. So the posterior tib fib ligament, the transverse intermalleolar uh, ligament have both just been detached and effectively there's a gap. And then I think about plafond. And of course, all of you, when you see an anterior tibial plafond fracture like this, will automatically want to reduce it and fix it. Of course, most of you will have spotted that I'm spoofing you because that is the back. So when we have an injury like that, why would we think it's any different from an injury at the front? And the degree of articular cartilage involvement is not as important to me as the degree of instability that's instigated by that fragment and how much the injury was in initially displaced. So I actually talk to patients and say, what happened? And if they talk about their leg or their foot hanging off their leg and some kind paramedic giving them a bit of uh, nitrous oxide and pulling on it for them, then it doesn't matter what the x-rays show, you know that's been a highly displaced and unstable injury. And then again, you look around, and uh, Haraguchi described this, that you do get fractures that run all the way across from uh, the back, including the medial side. And again, you've got little bits of bone blocking the reduction and little bits of bone all over the place within the ankle. So what makes for reduction and the stability? Can we really reduce these injuries and can we stabilize them? And the answer has to be visualization. How do you actually see everything that is there? And I come back to the little bits. I hate the little bits. So perioperative vis visualization options, well, Pre-op CT scanning, I think, should be something that we are very close to doing routinely. I'm sure there are injuries where you feel comfortable that you don't need it, but if in doubt, I think you do need it. In the UK, the last a year ago, when we were doing one of these sessions, I asked the, the audience how many people had um, in-theater CT scanning facilities. And actually, in the UK, we really don't. 
The investment hasn't been made, and it's probably a bad thing, but it's a lot of money. But we do have an arthroscope, and an arthroscope can in see inside a joint and help you visualize reduction. So what about the ones that you classify as a sort of small avulsion fracture, syndosmotic type injury? Do they really matter quite so much? Do we need to CT them? Well, probably not, but we do have to be aware of them. This was a patient that uh, arrived in the clinic not long ago with an ankle fracture that you look at, and she says she's just had pain all the time. And you look at their reduction, and you look at their fixation and their alignment, and everything isn't quite right. And the question is, why did a reasonably competent surgeon not get this quite right? And then you look at a CT scan, and you see the relevance of a very small posterior malleolar fracture with a bit of a little bit not helping with the reduction, which they were completely unaware of. They just carried on doing what they would do. So even with the smaller fractures, sometimes you have to think, why am I not getting this reduced? What's actually happening to stop me? But when you look, Getting through to the, the posterior aspect of this, there's a fairly consistent thing that you see little um, die punch type fractures going in up behind a posterior malleolus fra fracture and clearly going to block that reduction. So getting to the back of this is not something that any of you really would struggle with. And then you just need to decide what you're going to do to get the piece out, to get it reduced, and to fix the rest of the, the, uh, the fracture and make the thing stable. And then you've got a construct that you can depend on to do early uh, rehab and try and reduce the amount of impact of scarring and joint surface damage. And there's variations on the theme. This is, again, the case that I showed earlier. And you can see that on this occasion, we've, again, just used a little third tubular plate We've used one missing screw to get an initial fix. We've reduced it. We've got it stable. And I would be absolutely confident about moving that early. And I'd be probably pretty confident about weight bearing it pretty early. When you look in arthroscopically, you know, sometimes you do get a bit shocked at how much damage there is around. And we do see these very odd bruises on the joint surface that we don't know what the prognosis of those are. But you see damaged ligaments, so that's the anterior tibfib ligament with the syndosmosis behind it, clearly not quite in the right place. Syndosmosis opened up completely. And you can check and watch your reduction, make sure that bones end up in the right place. At the same time, you can remove extra bits. So I repeat that. You can see and check your reduction. So sometimes, particularly doing things without a tourniquet, the vision isn't perfect, but it's not bad. And you can see bits of bone actually in the fracture lines and simply remove them. You can get fragments at the front and remove them or replace them, put them in a better position. And you can wash all of those little bits and pieces out. And you can see and check your reduction. Now, why do I keep on repeating that? Because none of us are perfect. So this is a case that we did just recently. This is actually that really nasty, comminuted ankle fracture with lots of bits of bone about and bits of blocking bone getting in the way. And at the time we did the surgery, I could try and use the excuse, it was the fellow's fault, but it was the fellow and me doing it together. And you, know, you look at the x-rays and you think, not too bad. Yeah, OK. But somebody was slightly unhappy with the length of that screw and said, shouldn't we get a CT scan? And my reflex is, whenever you think about getting a post-operative CT scan, you should get a post-operative CT scan. And actually, what the case revealed was that we were way worse than just a bit of a screw that was penetrating because we hadn't reduced that fragment. And going through the whole order of what we did, 
We fixed it posteriorly, laterally, and then went after the medial side. And something funny was happening when we were doing the medial fixation. And we looked at the plate at the back, and we weren't quite happy with it. So we replaced it. And that's when it went wrong, because actually the fragment displaced. And what did we not do? We didn't put the arthroscope back in and check our reduction, and we could have saved a whole load of grief and a very nice piece oops, of rescue surgery um, done by one of my colleagues. So using arthroscopy does give you an advantage that you can see and check your reduction. What questions don't we know? There's always been this, ah, oh, you know, there's no point in fixing posterior malleolar fragments because... And actually, when you look at the results of the studies that perhaps define that, it is the approach of nihilism. It is the approach that says, actually, you know, you can't improve on um, the situation. You can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. But in my world, we get post-traumatic arthritis, and we have to deal with that. And I'd prefer to see it disappear. What's the biggest cause of poor prognosis? And really, if you look at the degree and uh, severity of displacement, the soft tissue insult is, is very considerable. You put that together with joint surface damage, and then you get into a scenario where both of those are defining the outcome. What's the ideal fixation? You've seen a couple of x-rays there of third tubular plates. Um, I'm not convinced we need terribly fancy plates. Um, can we get away with screws? Uh, I think probably not uh, routinely, but maybe sometimes. What about the approach? Do you use an approach, two approaches to the lateral posterior side or one approach? I think we need to really get a good, proper evidence base as to the consequences of both of those. The advantage of arthroscopy, well, there are now increasing numbers of papers out there. There is some level two evidence that says certainly you do no harm by doing an arthroscopy, and none of those papers are followed up long enough to know whether you actually do any good. But it is a way of looking at these injuries and uh, assessing whether you've got them right. And probably the biggest question mark is how should we be rehabilitating these patients? Well, if we can get to a point of reduction and stability, then we can actively rehabilitate them. And that may be the solution to trying to change the prognosis. What do we know? We do know that we need to think of a bit of visualization. And when in doubt, a CT scan would seem to be a good thing to do. Having an arthroscope in theater is not a surprise these days. It is just one of our tools. It's easily used. I can train mm, even Mr. Kelly, I suspect. And that is, of course, where the I have no confessions to make about this presentation becomes completely flawed because I've just done a quick advert for the course. Thank you. <laughs>